ever happened. Well, you go back to uh, you you go back to I mean what I mentioned earlier about not being able to question uh, anything Muhammad did, and so when Muhammad took the wife of his own adopted son, when Muhammad. Uh, had sex with a, a prepubescent, a prepubescent nine-year-old girl, a girl who hadn't even reached puberty. When Muhammad did all of these things, you are, if you have any resist, that's what the verse says. It says, if you have any resistance against anything that Muhammad did or taught, you're not a real Muslim. It says you have no real Islamic faith. And so the impact this has is if you eat so much as have any sort of hesitation in your mind about something Muhammad did, you're not a real Muslim. And so the psychological impact this has is don't question it, just defend it. Don't question it, just say it's wonderful. Uh, if you talk about beating women or something like that, what, what, what do they say? Oh, yes, but it's, it's, it's good. It's, it's, it's good. What about sex with prepubescent girls? You know, that, that's, that, that's, that's good, too. It must be good because Muhammad did it. And so it's a pretty, pretty wild impact this, uh, this religion has. Yeah, and today people are practicing that. We do have Muslim set speakers gonna simply say they don't see anything wrong with that. Even they are discussing, oh, is it like from a month one or is it like three years old? Like how old she needs to be for you to not only have sex with her, but after you have sex with her, you are divorcing her. Mm -hmm. um, that's Surah 65 verse um, four. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, David, I think someone is kind of just gently telling you, you are misrepresenting Islam. Oh, yeah? So, yeah. How, how's that? So. Oh, David, easy. <laughs> please show us where in Islam adoption is forbidden. I think you are confusing that Islam says, don't give them your name. Islam yep. encourages people to uh, look after orphans. <laughs> this is so... <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I actually see the I actually see the comment. Abbas, do you know what adoption is? So yeah, uh, so let, yeah, I can I can see right now. David, please show us where in Islam adoption is prohibited. He says, I think you are confusing that in Islam it says don't give them your name. In fact, Islam encourages us to look after orphans. Yes, I agree completely. Islam encourages you to look after orphans. Looking after an orphan is not adoption. Adoption is where they become part of your family and you become the new father and new mother to these children. That's when you they you adopt them into your family and they take on your family name. That's what adoption is. Adoption isn't simply taking care of an orphan. So notice you say, where is where is adoption prohibited? What it says is <laughs> you don't they, they that you can take care of orphans, but they don't actually become part of your family. They're not adopted in your family. And then you ask where, where adoption is prohibited. Guys, do, do you see the problem here? So notice, it, 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 you can read the historical background of this passage. This was to justify Muhammad marrying the wife of his own adopted son, who was called, up until then, who was called Zayed bin Muhammad. Then after after this revelation, and this, anyone who wants to look it up, it's Surah 33, verses 4 to 5. Surah 33, verses 4 to 5. That's the same chapter. That's the same chapter where... Um, where you have sort of 33 verse 37, the story of, uh, of Zayed and Muhammad taking his taking uh, Zayed's wife. Uh, Muhammad had an adopted son who was called who was called Zayed bin Muhammad, Zayed son of Muhammad. Then everyone was in an uproar because Muhammad took the wife of his own adopted son, which was frowned upon. You weren't allowed to do that, right? You're not allowed to take the wife of your own of your own son. And so they reasoned, well, you can't take the wife of an adopted son either. And so the solution was, well, then there's no more adoption. He's no longer called Zayed, son of Muhammad. He, uh, children, if you if you if you don't have a father for some reason, or your family has left you or something like that, and you've been adopted, now you're no longer part of that family that adopted you. There is no more adoption. You're not part of the family. Call them by their original by their original family's name. So there is no adoption. So uh, Abbas, uh, th thank you for agreeing with me, but you need to look up what, what adoption means. All right. And um, yeah, so it's another example where Mohammed simply justifies what he did to uh, how he wanted to save face. It's mm -hmm. gentle, yep. gentle, gentle saying like mm -hmm. that. And 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 th th think about this, ladies and gentlemen, going back to what I was saying earlier, right? So Surah 33, verses 4 to 5, um, that's abolishing adoption in order to justify Muhammad's Muhammad taking the wife of his own adopted son. In verse 37, that is one of the most disturbing verses ever because Muhammad marries the wife of his own adopted son. 
Now, just think about this, guys. If you had an adopted son and your adopted son has a wife and you start lusting after her, don't you, wouldn't you regard that as a problem? That's what Muhammad did. But the only rebuke against Muhammad was when Allah rebukes him in verse 37 for trying to cover up the fact that he was going to marry this woman, right? He tried to, he, he said to Zayed, no, go ahead and keep your wife knowing that he was going to, he was going to have her. And then Allah tells Muhammad, this is Surah 33, verse 37, Allah tells him that Muhammad has to marry Zainab in order to teach the rest of the Muslims that it's okay to marry the wives of their own adopted sons, that, that it's okay. So in order to, in order to show Muslims that it's okay to marry the wives of their own adopted sons. Muhammad, you have to take this woman. You have to take this woman and have sex with her. This super really, really, really beautiful woman. You have to take her for yourself so that I can teach a lesson to other, to other Muslims. Now, one, that's completely ridiculous. Muhammad doesn't have to do something for Allah to say it. Uh, but two, adoption was abolished. There is no, There are no more adopted sons whose wives you can marry. There's no more adoption. So Allah's entire basis for saying that, that Muhammad has to do this was total nonsense. Um, and so that's the situation. This is this is all Allah trying to justify Muhammad's behavior. But notice, Surah 3, verses 4 to 5, these verses abolish adoption in Islam. But then you have Surah 33, verse 6, which was then revealed that Muhammad is a father to Muslims, right? So notice, Muhammad is no longer a father of, of, of Zayd because adoption is abolished, but he's a kind of spiritual father and his wives are their mothers. And then even later, that becomes unacceptable. That part is taken out. Muhammad is no longer the father of Muslims. Muhammad's not a father of anyone in the Muslim community. And therefore, uh, at least any of the men, but Muhammad's not their father anymore. Sorry, orphans. So think, this is the message. Orphans of the world. Orphans of the world. If you do not have a mother and a father, you're never going to have one. You can have someone that, that, that takes care of you out of pity, someone that takes care of you out of charity, but you are never going to have a family. You are never going to have a, a you are never going to have parents. It's never going to happen. Get used to it. Muhammad didn't have Muhammad's mom died, his dad died. You you shouldn't get any parents either. This is sick stuff. This is sick stuff. Since um, Islam Allah steps in and then justifies Muhammad's sexual desires and then discredits the adoption, which is like actually a very awesome thing. Therefore, it is very, very difficult for Muslims to understand God the Father's love for humanity or what Lord Jesus Christ did on the cross for humanity so that we can be part of that amazing community. But um, as always, um, the Islam comes to confirm the previous scripture yet comes and then not only discredits but tries to meet up with all of Muhammad's need and mm -hmm. in this occasion his sex sexual need like he justified what he did to Zainab he justified what he did to Aisha he justified what he did to Sophia and list goes on and on and this is like most feminist man ever lived this is the best mm -hmm. example to humanity uh, there are like comments are moving so fast. Are more women or men living Islam currently? Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the statistics. Uh, I know that the statistic in the U.S. is that uh, basically the number of conversions to Islam are, are offset by the number of people leaving Islam. So yeah. as far as the as far as conversions, the numbers remaining roughly the same. So Islam is only increasing by like birth rates and immigration here um, in the U.S. But uh, yeah, I don't I don't know the actual statistics on um, on uh, on whether it's women or men who are who are leaving Islam. I, really, just just based on a lot of the stories, I would assume it's more men who are leaving Islam because women if they're married are, are usually in a harder, a harder situation, right? If you have uh, if you're a woman, you're a Muslim woman, you have two or three kids or something like that. And you know that leaving Islam might cause your husband to leave you and, and so on, then it becomes a much more, the, the reason I'm saying this is I've seen lots of women who want to leave Islam, but they just talk about how terrified they are of leaving Islam, knowing the impact this is going to have on their family and, and what's going to happen with their, with their husbands. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. And um, kind of, 
it is not the statistics, but from what from my experiences is, when a woman leaves Islam and becomes a Christian, uh, she intends to keep it uh, to herself because she knows that her children are going to be taken from her. Um, mm-hmm. In England, uh, law of apostasy is not practiced, but it is not surprising that we get to see um, ex-Christians are being um, taken middle of the street or got beaten, those kind of things. And especially, it is very difficult for Muslim women. But um, in different parts of the world, um, like once I've been privileged to sit down with in a community where there were over 200 Muslim women, uh, and in that country, I wasn't able to see the men. So it's different from where, where are you? Mm-hmm. Uh, also helpful to remember, uh, it's not about... Um, yes, place of woman in Islam is like very, very ugly and very bad. But end of the day, Lord Jesus Christ died for man and for woman. So we want both of the men and woman to be saved. Mm-hmm. One, of, one of the things um, we have in England mainly is uh, if a Muslim man leaves his family, so leaves Islam, as the time goes on, his family becomes a Christian. So that's a kind of positive side of it. Um, but is, as you know, is like last week we talked about, um, or week before that, I met with this nurse in hospital where she was a Christian who became a Muslim in the intention of marrying. And now she wants to, like she think, she says, Islam is practiced at home, which Islam she didn't know before. And she's not happy, but she can't leave it because she knows her son is going to be taken from her and she knows life is going to be awful for her. So there are the consequences of it. And because Islam is so peaceful, mm. Uh, that piece doesn't practice well. Mm. Now, Islam uh, Islam focuses on keeping people in Islam by any means necessary. So yeah. if that's uh, in an area where you can get your head chopped off for leaving Islam, that'll be the, the case. Uh, if it's, uh, we'll put massive family pressure on you to stay in Islam um, so that if you're young and you leave, your family's gonna turn their backs on you. Or if you're, uh, if you're an adult and a woman and you leave, then... Uh, you know, your husband's going to cause all sorts of problems for for your for you and for your for your kids and so on and so. Yep. It's, uh... But overall, um, essential thing for anyone who is kind of in the way of thinking, yeah, I want to give up this ideology. Remember, mm-hmm. Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. It yep. is the investment you make to spend your time with God, and that is worthy. Uh, yes, it's going to be hard but Lord Jesus Christ is worthy. And he promises that it's going to be hard, but I will be with you all the time. Those are kind of, there are lots of comments are jumping in here. Um, While I kind of try to come up with a couple of questions from the chat, um, where people are questioning the deity of Jesus in somehow, I don't know how they, they end up in there. But um, oh, I, I got one from a Muslim here. Okay. I think Dale Lee, based on his comments, uh, I think Dale Lee, based on his comments, uh, is a Muslim. But Dale says, Sam Shimon agree 100% the minimum age for a girl ready in marriage, ready for marriage, is puberty. Puberty, which was the exact case with Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, uh, that's false. Um, that's totally false. That... Aisha had reached puberty. And it's totally false that that's what Islam teaches. Surah 65, verse 4, teaches that you can have sex with your prepubescent wives and then divorce them. So, no, <laughs> um, Hatun, I'm sure you've noticed this. Now, if you just go back five or six years ago, the most, the most common response, the most common response to... Um, the most common response to the question of, of Muhammad and Aisha was that, no, Aisha, Aisha was much older. 18. And, she was yeah, 18. And, yeah, she was 18 when Muhammad uh, married her and stuff like that. And so she was much older. And they said this because people, um, 
the Muslim leaders were saying this because they knew that people didn't read the Muslim sources. They don't know what's in there. And so, but they made even your average Muslim on the street believe this. And so Muslims were running around saying this until people just start quoting the Muslim sources over and over and over again and saying, look, nine years old, nine years old, nine years old, exposing the, the tale as a lie. But now the most popular Muslim response, the most popular Muslim response now is, yes, she was nine, but she had reached puberty. She had reached puberty. Um, well... Uh, you want? Should we go through some of these sources? Because that's totally, utterly, completely false. Yeah, um, I can put them on on the screen. From yeah, my side. we have we have a bunch, and so there there are kind of two issues there. Um, there are two, kind of two issues. One is what the Quran says, and the other is whether Aisha, in particular, had reached puberty. Um, so let's just go here. And let's first let's let's read a few passages here just to start off. All right, I got my sources up. Sahih al Bukhari, thirty eight ninety six. Um, Khadija died three years before the Prophet departed to Al Medina. He stayed there for two years or so, and then he wrote the marriage contract with Aisha when she was a girl of six years of age, and he consummated that marriage when she was nine years old. Um, 50, Sahih al Bukhari, fifty one fifty eight. Consummated the marriage with her when she was nine years old. Sahih Muslim 3310, and I was admitted to his house when I was nine years old, 31, uh, 3311, and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine. Um, 2116, Sunan Abu Daud, the apostle married me when I was seven years old or six years old. He had intercourse with me when I was nine years old. So just to be clear, there's no disputing that Aisha was nine years old when Muhammad had sex with her. But uh, Sahih Muslim 3311, interesting comment here. Aisha reported that Allah's apostle married her when she was seven years old and she was taken to his house as a bride when she was nine years old and her dolls were with her. Her dolls were with her. What does that mean? Why do they include that her dolls are with her? What's the point of, of all the things that she, she brought with her? Why do they include that she brought her dolls with her? Well, because that's Arabic slang for hadn't reached puberty yet. You weren't allowed to play with dolls once you reach the age of puberty. So when they say she's taken to Muhammad's house to consummate the marriage and she still has her dolls with her, that's how they say that you that's how they say that you hadn't reached the age of puberty. Now, don't take my word for that. Um so we'll have we'll, we'll go through these real quick and then we'll have to uh we'll have to um uh go through the what the Quran says. But uh, you have you have in Bukhari itself, when it talks about Aisha playing with dolls, playing with dolls in the presence of the prophet, it specifically says that the reason that she was allowed to continue playing with dolls as she was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. She was a little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. Um I have to I have to look up that hadith real quick. Let, uh, let's no, look at what the... it's it's already on the screen. That's Bukhari. Oh, you already got it on the screen. Yeah, Bukhari. Okay. One hundred fifty-one. Um, narrated by Aisha. I used to uh -huh. play with the dolls in the presence of Prophet, and my girl, uh, my girlfriends also used to play with me. When Allah's mm -hmm. Apostle used to enter my dwelling place, they used to hide themselves. This is like very tricky. Mm -hmm. But the prophet would call them to join and play with me. The playing mm -hmm. with the dolls and similar images are forbidden. But it was allowed for Aisha at the time as she was little girl, not yet reached the age of puberty. So you so this is not us making this up. This is Muslim sources claiming that Aisha hadn't reached the age of puberty. So that's one thing. It's the Muslim themselves, Muslim sources themselves claiming that Aisha was allowed to continue playing with dolls because she had not yet reached the age of puberty. If she hadn't reached the age of puberty, what does that mean? She's prepubescent. But then we go to the Quran, and we have Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran. Uh, this is the Hilali Khan. He says, and those of your women as have passed the age of monthly courses, for them, the idda, that's the, the waiting period if you're divorcing them, if you have doubts about their periods, is three months. And for those who have no courses, i.e. they are still immature, their idda, prescribed period, is three months likewise. So this is giving divorce rulings about divorcing someone 
who is too immature to have a monthly a monthly men menstrual cycle, right? Because the previous the, it had already been revealed by Allah that if you if if you're divorcing a woman, wait three monthly cycles. So wait wait for her to to go through three periods. Um, to make sure that she's not pregnant before you before you send her on her way. The question then arose, Muhammad, well, there, 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 there are three categories of women. There are three categories of women who don't have monthly cycles. So what if we're divorcing them? And that is women who are too old. So they've, they've gone through, they've gone through, through menopause. Uh, two, girls who are too young. They don't have a monthly cycle yet. They haven't reached puberty. And three, women who are pregnant, right? Those are the three categories. Yeah. And so Muhammad tells them, well, don't wait three monthly cycles for a girl who is too young to have a period. Don't wait three three monthly cycles. Just wait three months. Wait, wait three months. All right. So notice this is this is this is talking about sex with a prepubescent girl. Wait three months before you divorce them. Um, and just to show, uh, I'll read three brief commentaries here. These are three of the most popular Muslim commentaries in history, three of the most respected Muslim commentaries in history. They all agree with exactly what we're saying. So Tafsir of Ibn Kathir, commenting on this passage, Allah the Exalted clarifies the waiting period of the woman in menopause, and that is the one whose menstruation has stopped due to her older age. Her idda is three months instead of the three monthly cycles for those who menstruate, which is based on the ayah in Surat al-Baqarah 2, 228. The same for the young who have not reached the age, the years of menstruation. The same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation, meaning they're prepubescent. Their idda is three months likewise in menopause. So Ibn Kathir agrees with me, disagrees with you, our Muslim friend. Tafsir Jalalain. And as for those of your women who re, uh, as for those of your women who no longer expect to menstruate, so they're too old, if you have any doubts about their waiting period, their prescribed waiting period shall be three months. And also for those who have not yet menstruated, meaning they're prepubescent, because of their young age. Those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age, their period also shall be three months. And of course, Tafsir of Ibn Abbas. And for those of your women who despair of menstruation because of their old age, if you doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months. Upon which, now we have the historical background. So the historical background of Surah 65, verse 4, is Muhammad is revealing his revelation from Allah about women who are in menopause. And so we have the historical background here. As for such of your women who despair of menstruation because of old age, if you doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months. Upon which another man asked, O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? along with those who have not had it because of young age, their waiting period is three months. So the idea here is Muhammad's revealing the part about uh, women who uh, who uh, have gone through menopause and someone raises his hand, well, what about girls who are too young to have a, a monthly cycle? And that becomes part of the Quran too. The answer is wait three months. And so notice, ladies and gentlemen, the myths that Muslims uh, that Muslim leaders, Muslim apologists spread. This is what this guy, this is what this guy, Dale Lee, is being taught by Muslim uh, speakers right now. Yes, she was nine years old. So notice, five years ago, no, she wasn't nine years old. She was 18. Then they got called out on that, exposed on that as liars. They got exposed as liars for that. So now it becomes, uh, okay, well, yeah, she was nine. We admit it. But she'd reached puberty thinking that we can't go through the sources and show one, according to the Quran, it's perfectly acceptable to marry, have sex with, and divorce a prepubescent girl all before she's ever had her first monthly cycle. You're, that All of that is totally fine with Allah. He gives the rulings on divorcing them after you've had sex with them. So that's one. And two, the Muslim sources themselves say that Aisha had not reached the age of puberty. Now, uh, now Hatun, if I were Dale Lee, and I saw all this for the first time. If I saw all this for the first time, and then I thought about where I heard this myth that Aisha had reached puberty, I would think, gosh, did these guys who told me that, have they read these sources? Of course they have. Do they know what the Quran says here? Yes. Do they know that? Do they know what it means about having dolls and her being allowed to have dolls? Yes, they do that. So what were they doing? Oh, you mean they were lying to me? Yeah. My own leaders and apologists were lying to me to keep me confident in Islam. The same people who tell me the Quran's been perfectly preserved right down to the letter. The same people who tell me that Muhammad is the greatest man who ever lived. The same people who do nothing but lie to me all my life. 
They lied to me about this too? Maybe, Dale, maybe you need to be listening to some new people. If you're if you're if your own if the people you are going to for your information are contradicting Allah and contradicting Muhammad and contradicting your sources, probably need to listen to some new people and just how sad of a situation is it where you have to go to two Christians to learn about your own religion because your leaders are keeping this from you. They want to keep you in a state of ignorance. Why? Because that's the way they that's the only way they know of to keep you in Islam. If I were a Muslim and if I was hearing those things, I guess first thing I would be throwing water on the face of my Muslim apologist or imam who has been lying to me all of my life. But here's the um, here's a couple of objections. First one is rem remember Muhammad, like he was the mercy to humankind. He's the best example to follow. Yeah, yeah, and, but I'm re I'm reading the comment you have on the screen. That's funny. Yeah, I'm I'm coming to that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, so um, he was so generous. As he married this six-year-old child when he was in his fifties, he expressed generosity and waited three whole years to have sex with him. Yep. Therefore, therefore, Aisha was old enough to marry with Muhammad. That's the first one. And second one is on the screen, uh, who is just simply discrediting all of the Quran and then Islamic sources. Because next comment um, in this also talking about, we can reject the Hadith if it is disagrees with the Quran. It <laughs> They reject the, the hadith if it contradicts the Quran. The Quran yeah. says you can have sex with a prepubescent girl. Yeah. So how's Muhammad having sex with a prepubescent girl, a rejection when he's doing exactly what the source um, says? Uh, but OK, so just to go through them, it sounded like the the objection was um, that, well, he married her when she was six and then didn't have sex with her until she was nine. And they conclude. And this is this is the this is the Muslim case for that. She had reached puberty. Uh, well, he waited. He must have been waiting for something. And so he must have been waiting till she reached puberty. Not what your sources say. My goodness, if Muslims, if you want to do something in your entire life that is worthwhile, read your own sources so you don't have to have your leaders lying to you about this. This, The Hadith, tell us what happened. The Hadith, tell us exactly what happened. Aisha got some sort of sickness and all her hair fell out and she's going around bald. And Muhammad waited until she got over that sickness and her hair grew back. Her hair grew back in when she was nine years old, and then Muhammad had then Muhammad had sex with her. He wasn't waiting. He was waiting till she wasn't bald. That's what he was waiting for. And also, that's he, what your sources say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and also there are sources which talks about actually Muhammad didn't pay the dowry, and then Abu Bakr said, okay, mm -hmm. you don't need to pay the dowry. You can just have sex with her. Yeah, and so, well, you, yeah, you actually have multiple suggestions. The other yeah. is like he, he just couldn't. He, she was like too small for him to actually penetrate, right? But there's yeah. there's nothing in there about him waiting for puberty. That's it. That's just that's just a myth. Uh, so the other one here, um, the other the other issue was he said that she, <laughs> we just we just means, read the sources. Yeah. We just read the sources. He said he said that the the passage in the Quran, the passage in the Quran is not talking about a girl who's too young for her monthly cycle. It's talking about someone who has some condition where she doesn't get it. Let, 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 me, let me read the historical background again. According to Ibn Abbas, this is one of Muhammad's companions and his relatives. Why, why in the name of common sense would a Muslim today in the chat think that he's a greater source of information about the historical background of the Quran than Ibn Abbas? let alone Ibn Kathir and the two Jalals. In other words, the greatest Muslim commentators of all time. You got a Muslim in the chat saying, nope, they're all wrong. I know better. So Ibn yeah. Abbas, what does Ibn Abbas said? Ibn Abbas, who was a companion of Muhammad, gives the historical background. Let's read it one more time. And for such of your women as despair of menstruation because of old age, if you doubt about their waiting period, their period of waiting shall be three months, upon which another man asked, so this is known among Muhammad's companions what the historical background of this verse is, upon which another man asked, O oh, messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? Notice, he doesn't say, oh, Muhammad, what about people who don't have a menstrual cycle because of some medical condition? Not what he says. He specifically says because they are too young, and the response is, their waiting period is three months. So uh, again, Ibn Kathir, 
The same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation, Tafsir Jalalain, so the two Jalals, and as for those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age, their period shall be three months. And Ibn Abbas says, someone basically raised his hand and said, Muhammad, uh, you're talking about uh, women who have gone through menopause. I have another question. What about girls who are too young? What about girls who are too young? And so Muslims, we have, we have Allah saying it in the Quran. We have the greatest Muslim commentators of all time confirming the interpretation. We have Ibn Abbas, a companion of Muhammad, giving the historical background and saying, no, this is about a girl who's too young to have reached a monthly cycle. She's too young. That's what the question was about. That's what the verse is answering. That's the question that the verse is Allah's answer to. And you have Muhammad saying that, uh, I mean, you have Muhammad allowing Aisha to continue playing with dolls. Why? Because in Islam, you're allowed to continue playing with dolls if you haven't yet reached the age of puberty. We look at all of this. What's the Muslim, what's the Muslim conclusion? Nope, she'd reached puberty, and that's all Allah is saying. And we throw out uh, we throw out Ibn Abbas, we throw out Muhammad's companions, we throw out the greatest commentaries of all time. We throw the word of Allah under the bus to make us feel better about our religion, and we ignore what the Hadith said. And this is what we do. And notice, Hatun, we've talked about this is what they always do. We read passage after passage after passage after passage in the Muslim sources, talking about entire chapters of the Quran being lost and forgotten, entire large passages, hundreds and hundreds of verses being lost, uh, verses being eaten by a sheep. We go through those passages, we ask the Muslim, what do these passages mean? It means perfect preservation right down to the letter. We read all these passages about Islam allowing sex with prepubescent girls. What's the Muslim conclusion? Islam only allows sex with a girl once she's reached the age of puberty. We go through all the passages in the Quran which affirm the inspiration and the preservation and the authority of our Christian scriptures. What's the Muslim conclusion? These sources are all some, they've all been corrupted and that's what Allah is saying by saying the exact opposite of what we think. It's just what you, we talk about, I, I, I have no, no other way of viewing Islam as it is just this massive source of spiritual darkness that clouds the minds of people to where they can read words off a page and they will conclude that it means the exact opposite. I can say, here's a sentence. It says, it says, it's day. What does that mean, Muslims? Up, oh, it's saying that it's night. It doesn't matter what the sentence is. They will conclude that it is the exact opposite of what they're saying. How can this be the true religion? Everyone, how can Islam be the true religion if it keeps people from being able to understand the simplest of statements from their own God and their own prophet? Amazing stuff. Uh, I'm guessing um, you are very busy. You've got family and you are doing lots of research and putting the materials together stuff. But I was wondering if you can make like maybe an hour in your uh, day to just teach Allah how to communicate better because you've got very good communication skills and I'm sure Allah could use some help on that area. Yeah, we should do another live stream sometime on uh, how to help Allah become a better communicator. No, um, no, no. No, notice because, uh, you know, no, yeah, know that this is a problem. Allah, he really wants to tell people, uh, tap your wives with a toothbrush. That's the final straw. But it comes out, beat them. Uh, he wants to say, guys, only fight in self-defense. It comes out, fight those who do not believe. You know, he just, he, he, Allah's trying. He's trying really hard to say what he means, but he just, he can't do it. He, it always comes out something uh, very horrible and violent. And notice, the longer Allah goes, the worse he becomes at communication, right? Yeah. So... Early on, early on, when Muhammad's receiving revelations, it's, uh, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Muslims say that when Allah said that, he really meant it. He really meant, to you be your religion and to me be my religion. Later, when he gets to fight those who do not believe in Allah, um, when he gets to, uh, you know, you have to you have to subjugate people based on what they believe, when it comes to uh, fight, not just the, the unbelievers, but also the hypocrites, all these passages about fighting people based on what they believe, Allah suddenly, he'd lost it by then, right? He lost it. He was like old age or something like that, where he just he couldn't remember how to communicate clearly. And and so much of Islam, much of Islam is just apparently the horrible communication ability of Allah. But fortunately, he's got the Muslims here in the chat who can clarify what he means. Yeah. Um, and, you know, the greatest Muslim commentators of all time, they didn't understand what a horrible communicator Allah was. So they actually took him at what he meant, right? They actually said, okay, what Allah really means here is exactly what he said, because he's the clearest of all communicators. Uh, but, you know, we get down to, so they thought that when Muhammad, I mean, that when Muhammad and Allah allowed sex with prepubescent girls, allowed beating of women and so on, they thought that they actually meant these things. But fortunately, we have modern 
uh, modern Muslims to set Allah straight and to say, nope, our God is just a horrible, horrible, horrible communicator. He's the worst communicator in all of history. But fortunately, Allah has modern Muslims in the chat on YouTube to say what he really meant and to correct him. Um, I think we can agree on a couple of things with Muslims. Okay, Allah is the worst communicator ever. Um, and then also we can say... Okay, okay. And, and uh, this is, that's according to them, right? That's yeah. according to them. I think yeah. these passages are perfectly clear. I think these passages are perfectly clear. It's Muslims who say, no, these are horrible passages. Allah is a horrible communicator. He, he's the worst ever. Muhammad is the second worst. Uh, but yeah, we actually have more respect for the communication ability yeah. of Allah and Muhammad than, than Muslims do. Yeah. yeah. And it is the Christian generosity. It's always Christian steps in and then try to put Allah a little bit higher than Muslims. Mm -hmm. But... I guess the bottom line is human beings are sinful. People do lots of crazy things in this broken world. And like someone kind of, let's say, had a sex with a child and then kind of repented, uh, said, I made a mistake. OK, let me get my, uh, my punishment and then we can uh, handle this. Mm -hmm. People are sinful, sinful people. But what happens with Muhammad is he is the best example to humanity according to Quran, according to the best communicator or worst mm -hmm. communicator. It's yep. not only he does it, he justifies it. And today his followers are practicing it to justify. That is the problem. Today in England, people go to prison for such a things. Mm -hmm. But if... If you are following the teachings of Allah, you simply say, I am following what the Quran is teaching. There was a case in Germany a couple of years ago. This guy couldn't control himself. He had a sex with a child and in the court without any shame. He said it was matter, matter of urgency and there is nothing wrong to do so according to my scripture. That is the problem. What Islam teaches, how Muhammad tried to justify it, Mm -hmm. applications are in today's world that is the problem not like sinful people do sinful things it is half people are justifying and taking Allah behind them to say yep this is okay let's continue to do it and this is like supposed to be the until end of until eternity like it's not just for seventh century according to Muslims it is applicable to at all times sadly mm -hmm. just fails in lots of places um mm -hmm. someone says uh, please tell dr what that called is the miracle of reinterpretation yeah <laughs> the yeah. miracle of reinterpretation yeah that's great uh you have you have two comments from uh dale lee re real quick um he says uh so again dale lee is a, a muslim um he says yeah. does the word young mean before the marriage age of puberty or because of her period is late because she's too young. Uh, let, let, let's just let's just go back. Ibn Abbas, companion of Muhammad. Someone some another man asked Muhammad. So this is what Surah 65 verse 4 is answering. O Messenger of Allah, what about the waiting period of those who do not have menstruation because they are too young? Too young for what? Too young for menstruation. Jalalain, as for those who have not yet menstruated because of their young age. Have not menstruated. Why? Because of a disorder? Because of some other problem? No. Have not menstruated because of their young age. Ibn Kathir, the same for the young who have not reached the years of menstruation. So they have not reached the time in life where they start menstruating. How, in the name of common sense, can Allah make it any clearer that he's talking about girls who have not reached menstruation? It's like, my goodness. And what do you have? A Muslim who's just disturbed by this. He's disturbed by what his God says, and so he tries to reinterpret it. Notice Dale Lee. If you reinterpret that and say, no, it's really talking about girls who have reached menstruation. In other words, it means the exact opposite of what Allah says here. If that's what you want to believe, you have to believe that your God is so hopelessly unclear 
in his communication ability that he deceived his greatest commentators of all time. Even the companions of Muhammad himself were deceived, and even his prophet, because Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl who hadn't reached puberty. Allah even was so sloppy in his speech that Muhammad himself thought he could have sex with a prepubescent girl. So that's what you have to believe. But you're the one who thinks clearly about this, and you're the one who actually understands uh, what, <laughs> what he's saying. And Dale Lee again says, uh, and why is everyone waiting three months if they are too young to get pregnant? The same reason, no, notice his reasoning here. Well, if she's, if she's prepubescent, then why would they be waiting? The same reason you wait if she's, if she's already gone through menopause. If she's gone through menopause, she's not getting pregnant either. But he still says, wait three months. Why? It specifically says, if you are in doubt, right? If you're concerned. In other words, you don't know biology very well. And so you just don't know whether she can get pregnant or not. You don't know if something weird is going on. And so if you are in doubt, go ahead and wait three months. It's, it's, that's what it says, right? So Dale, I don't, know what to, I don't know what to do. It specifically says, women who are too, yo too old for menstruation, wait three months. So you're saying, wait a minute, that can't be talking about being too old for menstruation because you, then you wouldn't be worried about them getting pregnant, right? You, <laughs> Dale, face it, you know more about biology than your God does uh, and, then, and then your prophet did. But if you want to say, no, it can't, be talk it can't be talking about them being too young, which is exactly what it says. It can't be talking about them being prepubescent, pre pre which is exactly what it says, because then you wouldn't be worried about them getting pregnant. Well, you'd have to say the exact same thing about girls who, women who've gone through menopause. Uh, they shouldn't be waiting either. And so basically you're saying, hey, the whole passage is stupid. I agree. But that's what you're stuck with. <laughs> that's what uh, you're stuck with. So he's saying, just wait three months. And it, it's an, it's, you know, you, you, as a Muslim, you should be taking that as an okay principle. Wait a minute. Um, I, I'm not waiting three monthly cycles. What am I doing? Just wait three months. That's, that's what the passage is saying. You're going to divorce a, a girl who's who's too young for a bra. She hasn't reached puberty. Um, wait three months. And if you're divorcing an, an older woman, no problem. Just just wait wait three months. So that's that's what it's saying. But yeah, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do, Hatun. Guys can't read words off a page and, and understand them. No, they they do read it. They do understand it. But there is a game called denial, and they quite enjoy that game. So this is how it works. I'm sure you already have the experiences. So first. They would do their best to defend. They do their more best to defend more. They do their more, more best to de defend more. And at the end, they will all give it up. It's, it, that, that's how it works. That's how it uh, works. Uh, hang on, hang on. Dale Lee says, uh, why didn't you quote Ibn Abbas about the age of marriage being puberty? Well, <laughs> and the Quran actually says the age of marriage is puberty. Dale Lee, give us the, give us the Quran verse saying that the age of marriage is puberty, chapter and verse. We'll go ahead and read that. And and best case scenario, you've got a contradiction on your hands. Best case scenario, because Surah 65, verse four, clearly allows marriage to and sex with prepubescent girls. So give us chapter and verse. We'll go ahead and take a look at it and see if uh, Allah has contradicted himself here. I think usually, um, I might be wrong. Yeah, we know. Yeah, we know. Yeah. We'll let, let, let him say yeah. it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> other thing is, like, sake of the argument. Okay, let's say, yes, they have to wait until someone child gets her period but mm -hmm. if you think i don't want to be mean like i'm very careful especially when i have christian guests that i kind of i am in the boundaries but man mm -hmm. who is in his 50s thinks or thinks it's okay to have sex with a child who is only nine years old because she had her period like think imagine that like don't imagine it but like imagine that like physically this, mm -hmm. she's just a child. Her body hasn't even grown yet. Uh, like her private part and, and versus his private part. How that's gonna work, like the damage it's gonna cause to her. Mm -hmm. That's just even sake of the argument. Yes, it's okay to marry with someone who just had her period age nine. Still biologically that is dangerous and that is just ugly. Mm -hmm. You are a man who is in his fifties. Where is your brain? Might be, but. Um, <clears throat> all right, let's go ahead and check out. He gave the, um, he so he gave Ibn Abbas, so prove the orphans. So this is his interpretation of 4-6. Uh, prove orphans, test the intelligence of orphans till they reach marriageable age. And uh, Ibn Abbas puts the age of puberty. Then if you find of them, then if you find them of, if you see that they possess sound judgment, 
righteousness in religion and a tendency to protect their wealth, deliver unto them their fortune. Um, notice what the Quran actually says is proof orphans till they reach marriageable age. And then Ibn, I mean, uh, uh, Ibn Abbas adds age of puberty. This is about giving them their money, right? This is about giving them their money. Yeah, this is about, you have money, you have money for these girls. And so in other words, you've got an orphan, she has an inheritance waiting, her parents have died, she's got money, and you're holding on to the money for her. You've got the money for her, right? When do you give her her money? Well, you have to wait until she's grown a bit. So he's pointing out here that Ibn Abbas says that the, the marriageable age, the marriageable age is the age of puberty, right? So if Ibn Abbas is correct, if Ibn Abbas is correct, then what is the marriageable age? What it, well, first of all, if Ibn Abbas, if we throw out Ibn Abbas, what's the marriageable age? I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine. Muhammad married Muhammad married Aisha when she was six, right? So, yeah. so that's a marriageable age. That is it. That is an age when you can marry a girl, six years old. Um, as far as when you can have sex with her, we know that Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl after her hair grew back, right? Once her hair grew back, Muhammad went ahead and had sex with her. So. If Ibn Abbas is correct here, that marriageable age means the age of puberty, best case scenario, best case, this is just a contradiction, right? So if I were if I were a Muslim, I would say, well, Ibn Abbas has to be wrong about the age of puberty here. It's not what the Quran says, it just says marriageable age. So that that could mean six, seven, eight, nine, according to according to Islam. He's saying puberty is the age that's actually counts. You have to reach puberty. Ibn Abbas says it, not the Quran. Ibn Abbas says it. But if Ibn Abbas is right, best case scenario, Allah has contradicted himself on this because Allah says very clearly that you can marry, have sex with, and divorce girls all past the age of puberty, I mean, all before the age of puberty, and Ibn Abbas himself says that. Ibn Abbas says that entire, that, that verse, Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran was about divorcing girls who were too young to reach the age of puberty. So, best case scenario, you got a contradiction. Um, I, as a Muslim, if you want, if you want to say Allah contradicted Himself, that's fine with me. Or you can say Ibn Abbas is wrong when he talks about the age of puberty being the age of marriage. Um, notice you can, you could, you could try to reconcile them by saying, yeah, that's that's the standard age of marriage. That's the, when it says yeah, they've the the marriageable age. Yes, people tend to wait until girls have reached puberty, so that's the age of marriage. That's that's the age of marriage that you're waiting for, but that's not an absolute. You don't have to wait in order to have sex with a girl until she's reached the age of puberty because we know that because Muhammad did it and Allah allowed it. And uh, so I, that would be the way to reconcile them, that this is just a standard age of, because most cultures wait until a girl has reached puberty. Muhammad was, Muhammad was different and his God was different. So I think that's the best you can do with that passage. Uh, again, so your, your, your options are, one, a lot, when Allah says marriageable age, he means puberty. So one, that's one, in which case he's contradicted what he said in Surah 65, verse four, and your God contradicted himself. And so uh, if you think the Quran has no contradictions, you'd be wrong. Two, you can say Ibn Abbas is wrong when he says marriageable age is the age of puberty. Marriageable age is just whenever her dad says, go ahead and marry my daughter. It doesn't matter if she's six, seven, eight, nine, doesn't matter anywhere in there. Um, in this case, you'd have to say, what age do fathers normally say their daughters can get married? Like, so six, seven, eight, nine, that's fine. This girl doesn't have father and mother anymore, so we'll apply the same age to them. And that's when you give them their money. Or you could say that when it says marriageable age, it just means when people normally marry, um, when people normally consider it appropriate to marry a girl, even though this is not a rule with Allah, this is the age at which uh, girls tend to get married uh, in our culture, even though it's not an absolute. Those are your options. None of them are good. None of them change what Surah 65 verse four means. And so Dale, I have to say, if you're embarrassed by your prophet having sex with a nine-year-old girl and you're ashamed of your God for allowing it, um, you're ashamed of your God and prophet. Why are you defending them? Why are you defending a God that you're absolutely ashamed of? Why are you defending a prophet that you're absolutely ashamed of? Um, I don't know. Let us know. Um, just a side note. It seems that um, he went to answering the Islam website to give you those sources. Just be aware of it. Yeah. So Muslims are using your website to defend Islam. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, you know, that, that's, why we, that's why we know these passages. <laughs> And it's, it's, just, it's just amazing, right? Because here, here's what's amazing, right? 
We can show them a verse saying exactly what we say. We can show their greatest commentators of all time agreeing with us. Then they will quote then they will they will tell us that Allah is the worst communicator of all in all history and that Muhammad is the worst communicator in all of history besides Allah. And then they'll they'll try to quote Allah and Muhammad defending their point and then they'll go to our <laughs> our websites to get their information and it's just gosh it's it's amazing. Guys, if you're telling us that Allah is the worst communicator in all of history, he's such a bad communicator that even his greatest commentators of all time agreed with us, how do you then go to that same God who's the worst communicator ever and quote him to try and explain what he means when even in the best case scenario for you, he's contradicted himself? This is this is amazing stuff. And in a sense, it is good. So they do not trust their sheikhs, their imams, their Muslim apologists. They trust Christians when it yeah. comes to... Yeah, they know that. Yeah. Um, oh well, I I would love to go more, but I am aware that you've got live stream which is coming up, and we already been live one hour forty eight minutes eight second. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll just pick the last question. Um, so I'm not gonna go to Dali again. Um, let me pick the last question. So if if Islam is simply according to Quran, just discrediting the uh, place of woman when it comes to as a wife she should she can be beaten, and she can be married as a child. Um, can we can we kind of say uh, those should, those are the our top uh, five reasons that so someone should leave Islam? Like, can someone put those as a reason to leave Islam, or would you say there needs to be? Uh, there needs to be other um, other reasoning for this. Like, play, uh, is the place of woman when it comes to Islam will be the, one of the top uh, points that someone should give up the ideology? Uh, yeah, I, I would say certainly because we know um, and we know uh, medical studies and so on the the harms of having sex with prepubescent girls and so on. They have massive problems in places where this is practiced because, um, and Muslims never, never seem to understand this. You can go to their greatest apologist. They don't seem to understand this. They all have this attitude, old enough to bleed, old enough to breed. So even the ones who say, uh, once a girl has reached puberty, she's ready. She's ready for intercourse. Guys, that is medically false. Yes, you can get pregnant. That doesn't make it a good idea. As Chris Rock once said, you can drive with your feet. That doesn't make it a good idea, right? Here's why. Puberty is a process. It takes several years. It starts, a, a girl's breasts start developing. She gets her monthly cycle. Then her body, her entire body starts going through the process of change. Her hips begin to widen. Uh, her birth canal begins to widen. That process takes a few years. So, and this is a problem, especially in areas of, of Africa where girls are, I mean, they, they have, it, it's it's pretty sad to, to read about them, but basically as soon as it, 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 these girls are getting pregnant, as soon as they can get pregnant, right? As soon as they can get pregnant, they're getting pregnant. Well, guess what? They still needed a couple of years for their body to prepare to deliver a baby. Their body is not ready, right? They're they're physically capable of getting pregnant, but their body has changed, right? And then these girls uh, these girls die or they need C-sections and so on. Um, but they, they end up with these problems where there's just a steady stream of, of urine um, leaking out of them because of the damage done to their bodies by getting pregnant at, at this, this, this really young age and their bodies were not prepared for it. But notice, even, even Dale here is defending this idea Hey, the, the moment a girl, so one, he's, he's contradicting his own, his own God and his own prophet. Muhammad had sex with Aisha before she had reached the, the age of puberty. She still had her dolls with her. And Allah allows you to marry a prepubescent girl, have sex with the prepubescent girl and divorce the prepubescent girl. Again, all before she's reached what are called the years of menstruation. Um, so that's what your God and your prophet allow. But even if we were to go with what Dale says, and if we agreed with him that once a girl's old enough to bleed, she's old enough to breed, this sick mentality, that's false. That's biologically false, right? It is a bad idea for a girl to get pregnant the second she can get pregnant. She should not be having sex then because it is dangerous 
for her to get pregnant at that young of an age. Her body needs to change. Her hips need to widen. Her birth canal needs to widen so that she, her body is actually physically prepared to give birth. So even best case scenario, if we went with the reinterpretations of modern Muslims, they're still wrong. So this is actually beating women into submission, um, having sex with, with, with prepubescent girls, or best case scenario for, for the Muslims here, if we listen to them and not to their God, not to their prophet, we just listen to what modern Muslims say. Uh, yep, she's reached the age of the, the ripe old age of nine, uh, have sex with her. That's the example our prophet set. Even that's bad. That is a bad idea. It is bad for girls. It's bad for women. And so if Islam, it, it's just, I mean, you end up with a contradiction here. Islam says Islam says that, Maha, that that Allah sent Muhammad as a mercy to all mankind. Certainly not a, a it's certainly not a, a mercy to women who are being beaten and impregnated at this at this extremely young age. It can't be good for women, and so it can't be a mercy for all mankind. And so notice that's just kind of that's just kind of one issue. There's all kinds of issues related to women in Islam with the you know with the prostitution and uh, the the taking sex slaves and things like that. They've got all these issues. This is this is just bad. And so I think if there were really, really great evidence that Islam is true, in other words, if they said, yeah, all these things are bad, they look bad, but we have this great evidence for Islam, I think you could say then, then, hey, you might want to rethink these other things. But when it comes to Islam, all we've got are these bad things. We don't have any evidence to counterbalance them. We don't have anything that could counterbalance them. It's all just bad, 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 bad stuff. And we never get to any actual evidence. And the actual evidence we we do look at, you know, the perfect preservation of the Quran, Muhammad's the greatest man ever. The the uh, the arguments that they that they do give us, they fall apart upon the slightest bit of research. And the only way around it is for Muslims like Dale Lee to completely reinterpret everything their God and Prophet said. But guys, we're not reinterpreting them, right? We can't we can't accept your religion based on your modern reinterpretations. If we wanted to, if we wanted to accept your religion, it would have to be based on what your God and your Prophet said. But they're, your God and your prophet are the ones you're saying we can't trust because they couldn't communicate. And so I don't know what to do with this religion. But yeah, I would say this is one of the good reasons to uh, to be concerned about Islam. It's very, very biologically, physically, medically harmful to girls and women. And this again, this isn't this isn't just our opinion. This is these are these are facts about the spread of Islam around the world and the impact that Islam has on populations that actually incorporate Muhammad's teachings. They are the worst places in the world. They are the worst places in the world for women, most majority countries. And um, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much sharing all this knowledge with us and uh, telling simply in a simple, I'll put that in a one sentence, keep away from Islam. Mm -hmm. It is like very bad for humanity. Keep away from yeah. Islam in all form and all shapes. Um, please do... Uh, kind of watch the video again hopefully you will get the references i try to post some of them purpose of this is not we get more information for ourselves purpose is you get the information and you share it sharing is caring and the people we share it muslim people because they are in very very terrible place and we want them to come and bow down lord jesus christ and uh, remember that is at one o'clock eight o'clock um david wood's time one o'clock our time there will be live stream in Acts 17 apologetics please be there to see another um, destruction of Islam mm -hmm. uh, another destruction of Islam um, you can kind of uh, watch that and also let me put the last link and um, David thank you so much for mm -hmm. coming in and helping us my prayer is that we will use it for the kingdom and also and also, uh, hopefully, we will see you again. Until then, look after yourself, keep safe, and be blessed. Amen. God bless you.